普通の人には分かんないんだろうけどえっえっちょっと何してんの乗っけてってあの山の向こうまではな,なんでなんで行きたいから意味分かんないって予約してた本が届いてるんだよ本屋行って受け取らないといけない春日君私ね私見てたんだよ春日君が佐伯さんの体操着盗んだところ。Kasuga is your local small town pretentious loner who's also kind of a dickhead. Even though he was supposed to be his friends in class, he believes himself betterer and smarterer because he reads French poetry. When we're introduced to him, we learn two important things about him. The first being that he's constantly talking down to others, distancing himself, because his peers don't read literature. The other is that he's got a crush on a girl in his class, Saiki. And when this pompous bastard goes back to class for forgetting his book, Le Fleur du Mal, something catches his eye. Some gym clothes left behind by Saiki. Remember when you were a teenage boy in middle school and did the most head ass thing of sniffing and stealing some girl's gym clothes? I sure don't because that's fucking stupid. For many reasons. It's gym clothes, probably smells of sweat and dirt. How could that be all that appealing? Ever been near girls exercising? Girl sweat don't smell any better than non girl sweat. But the bigger reason, it's outright theft and sexual harassment. While Kasuka isn't directly harassing the girl, it's an invasion of privacy. And when Saiki finds her clothes missing, she's justifiably upset because she assumes some asshole's getting off on it. Despite believing himself to be so much smarter, He's not smart enough to make that decision in the first place, and to then get caught by Nakamura, the class sadist. Nakamura approaches Kasuga. She uses this opportunity to blackmail him over the situation and to form a contract. When I say Kasuga's a dickhead, I mean that in a way you'd describe the average middle schooler. Someone who's naive about their place in the world. Give them a few years and they might become more tolerable as a person. Nakamura is unlike that. She is actively depraved and has a love for that same depravity. She is openly hostile towards others and despises everything around her. And when she makes this contract with Kasuga, she actively abuses him verbally, physically, and even sexually. She uses every opportunity she can to humiliate him as she wants to see a real deal, genuine pervert. And Kasuga is to be that pervert. Between Nakamura herself and the relationship she has with Kasuga, my interest was captured. Every time Nakamura showed up on the page, I would begin to wonder what perversion she will force on him next. And that interest only became a captivation with each new chapter as the level of depravity would only increase further and further as I began to wonder what is the breaking point, or even if there will be a breaking point, if Nakamura will somehow get away with all this abuse. But that's not the only reason why I kept reading. As with any good story, what sticks with me, at least, long after I first go through her work is the characters, the imagery, and especially the themes at play and how those themes are addressed. One of the initial themes introduced also plays a key role in the catalyst of the story, that being puberty and the sexual frustration that it causes. When a person enters this stage of life, puberty and all those thoughts of sex probably leads to a large portion of your problems. The concept of thinking with your dick didn't just come into existence for no reason, whether it's something that can be retroactively comedic as embarrassing yourself in front of the boy or girl you like, or looking for porn and stumbling on some weird shit that you were not interested or ready for in finding, which happened to me a lot and I had to learn various websites as methods of tag exclusion, to the shit that happens in Akinohana that get these characters in trouble. Most obviously is Kasuga stealing Saiki's gym clothes. When I described that as head-ass earlier, neither the head nor ass was involved in thought, only his dick. With all the sexual thoughts and urges running through your head, the frustration of that to begin with, but also the frustration of acknowledging those thoughts in the cultures that still look at sex as sinful, but also the frustration of figuring out what to do and how to express those thoughts. Whereas some characters have a general idea what to do with sexual thought, which still get them in deep shit. Like, actual content warning if you plan to read this, there's some straight up rape at some point. Nakamura, in contrast, doesn't know what to do with all that. 
Between her personality and a lack of that critical knowledge of how to express all the fuckery in her head, she went down the road of developing a fascination of degeneracy, and especially of perversion. That is, of course, not the only thing the characters are struggling with. All the main characters here are trying to find someone to connect to, someone who truly understands them. The women in this story end up believing that Kasuga is the connection they've been looking for, whether it be trying to get to the other side with him through his perversion, or through his love and passion for books which allows for the respective girl to feel an escape from their day to day. And that term, the other side, is a large part to understand the motives of these characters. The story presents you with this small town surrounded by mountains with seemingly no escape in all directions. When Nakamura first calls out to Kasuga on his bike, she asks him to take her over the mountains to see the other side. That is, to escape their normalcy. Nakamura wishes to escape the staleness of the city and the staleness of a normal life. Not just Nakamura, but all the main characters in the story want to reject normalcy. They're sick of their daily monotony, and the way they try and do that is by embracing their true self, learning to accept the darkness within. Not even in a bad way either, more so acknowledging all the different aspects of yourself, the good and the perverted, living your life in the way true to you. Everyone else be damned for living a compromised, boring as shit existence. I'd rather not talk more about the story and themes of this manga and how they develop. Everything I've discussed so far can be found in the beginning chapters of the story, and to discuss more would require discussing not only future events, but also the way this manga is structured. And I'd rather leave that there for you to go and read it instead of having some asshole like me spoil Akunohana. While I'm done with the manga, there's still a 13 episode anime for me to talk about. Quick side tangent, years ago, before I had any interest in reading Akunohana, I had heard of the anime because of one of the opening themes. The second opening theme, played for episodes 4 through 6, is sung by Mariko Goto from the perspective of Nakamura's character. I've been a fan of Midori for a long ass while, their songs are fucking awesome, and I just love Mariko Goto as a musician. After reading through the manga, then deciding to see how the manga is, did I learn how good of a fucking choice to have chosen Mariko Goto for that role. Anyone who has ever listened to Midori, or have seen some of the recordings of their live performances, will tell you that she is the perfect fit. With that aside, let's talk about the unfortunate case of the Akunohana anime. If you thought I called it unfortunate because of the way it looks, jokes on you, I love this shit, fuck you! Probably the only thing people tend to know about this anime is that the show is entirely rotoscoped. That being, filming every scene and taking each of those live action frames and drawing over them. And when I turned episode 1 on, yeah, it definitely took a minute to get used to the look. And by the end of watching the show, I ended up really liking the look. Rotoscoping is not that commonly used in animation to begin with. We as an audience aren't used to seeing such a technique, especially on this scale of having every character be rotoscoped throughout the show. It can be something people find somewhat uncanny. Real quick, because of this show, I've seen people online talk mad shit about the rotoscoping technique, saying that it looks like straight trash. Yeah, because there's never been a good looking example of rotoscope in anime ever. Hopefully you can see that rotoscoping doesn't look like shit. It can be made to look just fine, matching that traditional anime aesthetic that weebs apparently don't know what to do without. Instead, what's happening here in Akunohana is that the uncanniness is being deliberately emphasized. These frames of live action footage are being handed to professional, skilled animators who know what they're doing and could very well have made each frame more conventionally appealing. Seriously, go check out the credits for some of the animation directors and key animators who worked on this. You'll see shit like Jojo, Madoka Magica, Mushishi, Azumanga Daio, Mawaru Penguin Drum, and Eizouken. The choice made by director Hiroshi Nagahama to go with rotoscoping adds a lot and fits with the tone and the story of Akunohana. The characters are ugly on the inside. They're not good people. Not only that, the creator of the manga, Shuzo Oshimi, has stated that a lot of Akunohana is autobiographical. Of course, there's also a lot of fiction added, but he says he based a lot of the characters on himself and some people he knew. So by going with rotoscoping and using real people to act in place of the characters adds a degree of realness to everything that's happening. You look at a character's face and that's just some dude. 
which is also why the character designs do differ from the source material. It's also like how in the Yakuza series when a bunch of real ass dudes show up on screen, despite it being all models, the RGG team decided to leave in all the imperfections on those characters. The moles and the pores adds an insane amount of realism to further add weight to the story and Akinohana uses that same mentality here. Although there is one moment where the bookstore owner looks fucking dumb. The fuck is up with that fake mustache? Oh, right, because that actor, Shuzo Oshimi, doesn't have a mustache. Why the fuck did they do that? It looks goofy. And because the show had to be filmed on actual locations, there's a lot of shots that are unique to the anime that aren't present in the manga. One of my favorites is this scene where Kasuga is walking home with his classmates and he splits off from them to go to the bookstore. The fucking framing on this. Mm, orgasmic. Having the characters walk off screen and then walk onto the mirror which frames that intersection so perfectly gives a real feeling of space to the street. And just thinking about how this had to be shot, it must have been a bitch to position the camera in such a way to get that angle they were looking for. To be able to capture down the street and the intersection. Not only does filming in live action give a sense of depth and weight to the space around them and to the movement of the characters, it can also help in adding a fuck ton of depth when it comes to the emotions of the characters. There's a scene where Kasuga, Nakamura, and Saiki have biked up a mountain and they're caught in a downpour, and Kasuga is having a fucking breakdown. And man, Kasuga's actor is just going hard on this scene. Being able to capture real facial expressions here just makes the scene hit so much harder. What a great moment. Then, episode 13 hits. The first half animates the 20th of the 57 total chapters. The episode ends by recapping the 12 episodes that came before and teasing the episodes to come in part 2. At least, I wish they were episodes to come. And this is the unfortunate case that the Akunohana anime suffers. Since it came out in 2013, there has been zero mention of a continuation of any kind, and I kinda doubt that any continuation will get greenlit unless the rotoscoping gets dropped. Now, don't get me wrong, I'd come so hard I'd drown in it if I woke up one day seeing news of the contrary, but the reality of the situation just isn't ideal. While there are people, like me, who really like the anime and what it's going for, it was fucking hated when it came out. The art style that the show is going for actively hurt the bottom line since so much of the audience fucking dropped the show on the first episode. And that's a shame. But what I think is the bigger reason why the show won't get continued in its current form is because rotoscoping is a way more expensive method. Before any animation, before a single frame is drawn, it is a full on live action production before it becomes an animation production. Actors need to get hired, permits are needed to shoot on location, equipment like the lighting needs to get bought or rented, the crew needs to be hired and fed. Anything and everything required on every other live action show is needed here as well. And that shit costs money. Then, once you've got all that shot, only then does the animation start. Rotoscoping a show on the scale is way more expensive than just animating it like every other anime that comes out. Unless a fuck you budget is given to finish the anime, it just isn't gonna happen. Though it is unfortunate, that is oddly fitting. The reality of the situation is unintentionally thematic with the story of Akunohana. The anime got made to try something different, it tried to deviate from the norm. And yet that deviancy from the norm made others hate and reject it. But all this leaves the live action movie being the full adaptation at this current time. Well, full adaptation would be a generous description. The movie's two hours long and is trying to fit 57 chapters worth of story and character in it. Naturally, so much of the manga had to be cut out. And the pacing of what is shown is fucking insane. Alright, I'm getting into minor spoilers. Time on screen to skip that, but I won't be discussing anything major. There's a scene where Kasuga sees Nakamura and Saiki talking to each other, and this scene not only combines three different scenes from the manga, but it does it in a fucked up way where it changes Saiki's misunderstanding of the sex talk, where Kasuga sees that she overheard the end of their conversation. It defeats the purpose of Kasuga visiting Saiki because Kasuga is not supposed to have any fucking clue what Saiki's upset about. But there's also some weird decisions. Some minor that I don't understand, and some major. To start with Minor, the date scene. In the manga and anime, Nakamura dumps a bucket of water on Kasuga and runs the fuck off, Saiki not knowing who did it. Movie Nakamura uses a can of soda? And she just stands there spraying Kasuga for so long and Saiki's all like, the fuck was with Nakamura? Such a minor detail got changed and for the worse. 
But a major change is the structure of the story. The manga is told chronologically, the movie isn't. The movie bounces between the first and second half, which can feel jarring for someone familiar with the source material. Time skipped and I was like, why are we here now? I feel the reason for this is because the movie doesn't adapt a whole lot of the second half, so if it were played chronologically, then that section would feel rushed and short. But by spacing it out, it attempts to avoid that feeling. Doesn't change the fact that I wouldn't recommend this. Maybe watch it out of curiosity if you've already gone through the manga and anime, but there's no issue if you decide to skip this. After I read through Akunohana, I began to wonder to myself, why was Nakamura so captivating? Every time she entered the scene, I could feel my heart rate increase, excited to see and find out what will happen. And that's a little strange. Nakamura's a terrible person, she's an abusive asshole. But there's some aspects to her that deeply interested me. Her nihilism and her desire to break conformity and to enter the other side. Back in middle school, back when I was first entering puberty, I would have related a lot to these characters as I was a lot more nihilistic and was a lot more of a loner. Not only am I very much introverted, but I also didn't like most other people in my grade. I would not say I was anything like Nakamura at all, instead I was acting a lot closer to how Kasuga was at the beginning of the story. I didn't really care for others around me, instead diving deep in my hobby of choice, video games instead of books, and I was a bit more of an asshole and a little bit pretentious even, much like him. And I especially carry that nihilistic thought that Nakamura has. That idea of nothing fucking matters. Who cares? As I got older and started going through high school, the nihilism turned into existentialism. Nothing matters turned into nothing matters. So find the value. Much like some of the later events in the story, I am to create and enjoy things that I feel create value and give purpose to my life. That's among one of the reasons why I'm making videos right now. And another aspect I see in myself is that desire for the other side. To reject the quote unquote normal, the mundane, the expected, and the accepted. The things that I ended up finding value in is the niche, the obscure, the weird, and I feel that that same feeling can be applied to anyone who reads through Akunohana. There's no way someone can read through this manga without being a little weird themselves. And I feel the reason why Nakamura is such an enticing character is because she's pure in these values. Sure, she's not a good person, but she's lonely, she's bored, she's angry, and I feel her for that a lot. Nakamura may be a flower of evil. Regardless, a flower's not beautiful.